In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about some tax planning opportunities for W-2 full-time employees. The tax code should really be viewed more as a roadmap and incentives created by the government to facilitate certain types of activities. So for example, if you really understand the tax code and how deductions and credits work, you can see that the government really wants to provide incentives and encourage people to start businesses and to invest their money. And this is shown by the way that business owners get a lot of deductions and get to take certain credits against their taxable income that other individuals who aren't business owners don't get to take. Also, investment income is usually taxed at preferential rates, such as capital gains rates, and there's other benefits that can arise from investment types of income. So unfortunately, on the other side of that are W-2 salaried employees. There actually aren't really any incentives in the tax code for full-time employees, and this is because they're not necessarily creating jobs or doing things like investing capital back into the economy, but you are paying tax, unfortunately, at the highest rates, and you're also paying additional taxes, such as payroll taxes, that are on top of any federal or state tax that you owe. So full-time employees really are at a disadvantage when it comes to the tax laws. So I do wanna walk you through some of the limited tax planning opportunities out there that do exist for anyone that is a W-2 employee. And for purposes of this video, I'm really talking about full-time employees that get a W-2 salary. If you're a business owner and you have to pay yourself a salary that you know is going to result in you getting a small W-2 from your company, that's not really covered here. I would actually check out other resources for, for tax planning strategies for business owners. This is really for those individuals that work for a company and are full-time employees. So let's go ahead and dive right into what some of the tax planning opportunities are. So I'll start with the first and maybe most obvious one is that I talk a lot about this in my other videos. W-2 salary income is the absolute worst type of income you can earn. It is taxed at the highest ordinary income rates. You also pay payroll taxes on top of that. So it's absolutely the least efficient from a tax standpoint type of income you can earn. If there is flexibility, depending on how your company is structured, what type of work you do, to switch yourself from at least giving getting a portion of your salary or the income that your company pays you from being a W-2 salary to what's called a 1099 salary or earnings that's reported as if you're an independent contractor and not an employee of the company, then I highly encourage you to pursue that route. If you can convert any amount of what you're being paid from W-2 to a 1099, then that is great from a number of reasons from a tax standpoint. So what are the benefits of being a 1099 as opposed to a W-2? So first, you get to take deductions against that income. If you're paid a salary and it's all W-2 earnings, you don't get to claim any deductions. So if you work from home in your own office, if you pay for your own cell phone, buy your own laptop, go out for dinner you know, to, with fellow colleagues or other people in your network, for business related activities, anything like that, you are not getting a tax deduction for that. On the other hand, if you can flip those that same earnings to be in 1099, then you do get those deductions. You get to claim any reasonable business deductions that relate to the money that you're making. So that creates a ton of tax deductions that you can claim on your return just by basically changing what the, we call the money that you're earning from your company. Also, depending on what you're doing, there might be the ability to set up an S corporation to reduce payroll taxes on your 1099 earnings. That structure is not available if you are a W-2. So I have a video where I talk about the S corp payroll tax strategy. Usually we think about that in the context of a business and setting the business up as an S corp. But if you're just working for yourself and getting paid a 1099, you can also potentially use that S Corp strategy as well. So I'll link to that video below so you can understand how that planning actually works. But don't forget about payroll tax planning because that can really add up over time. And they are significant savings there if you can use the S Corp strategy. Also 1099 earnings are almost always eligible for what's called the 20% qualified business income deduction. So if you're not subject or able to plan out of some of the limitations to that deduction that do apply to certain high earners or people like doctors and lawyers that are doing more personal services type work, 
then you get a flat 20% deduction on all of your 1099 income. So that can be huge as far as the savings that you can get every year. And again, you don't get that 20% qualified business income deduction on any W-2 earnings. Lastly is that under current law, we are limited in the amount of state and local taxes we can claim. So currently after, after the Trump tax law changes a few years ago, we are only able to deduct $10,000 worth of state and local income taxes. So if you sit in a high tax state or really any state that has state taxes, you're probably paying over $10,000 of state and local taxes. So that is a huge limitation on that deduction that you can claim on your federal return for those state taxes. If you sit in New York, especially New York City, California, any other state, even states where you don't think about this, like South Carolina that actually have a high state tax rate of 7%, you're going to be impacted by this. And if you do have a, a structure where you're getting paid at least part of, part of your income from your business as a 1099, you can do what's called assault pass-through entity tax election in some cases, and that can let you deduct more than $10,000. So that's really getting into more of the sophisticated tax planning that we do. But just keep in mind that if you are able to convert some of your earnings to a 1099, then you could potentially do what we call SALT PTIT or pass-through entity tax election planning that can allow you to deduct more than $10,000 of savings. And that can be huge as far as federal tax savings for any state and local taxes that you pay. So moving on to the second planning opportunity. So this is one I really like a lot. And when I used to do consulting, I worked with a lot of people who were really high earners and were paid a salary, but they also had some sort of side hustle going on. So this can be anything. It can be, you know, I, I know a lot of friends that are teachers who do lawn care type businesses in the summers, you know, things that are seasonal when they're off in the summer, that anything that really is a business, it can be an e-commerce company, it can be consulting, it can be anything that's a business venture that you're doing to, to make money. We call that a side hustle. So that can allow you to deduct some of your, your business expenses through that side hustle. So for example, if you think about something like your cell phone, then if you're a full-time employee, you can't deduct anything for that. But if you've got a side hustle where you're doing something on the side and you're obviously using your phone partially for that as well, you can deduct a piece of that telephone cost that you pay every year through that business. So you probably don't get 100% deduction. You really are only gonna get the piece that really relates to the work you're doing in your side hustle but that will allow you to start to run some expenses through that business. So that's a great way to start taking things like home office deductions, anything like that that's otherwise not available to you as an, a full-time employee. You can take some or all you know, of those deductions through your business that is now a side hustle in addition to what you're doing full-time in your job. So. A side hustle is a great way to start creating some business deductions. It's also a way to start earning extra money on the side. And you can earn that money in a much more tax efficient way than you're earning your salary that you're paid by your company. So it's great for a number of reasons from just a pure financial you know, wealth building standpoint. But I love it from a tax standpoint because in a lot of cases, you might find that after a few years, that side hustle is actually replacing your income in a way that you can just move and focus your time on that. So there's just a number of reasons why I think the second option is great. It's done a lot by really high earners who want to create business deductions and just kind of, you know, test the waters on, on something new if you're not, you know, thinking about maybe doing a, a career shift or something in the future. The third one is that when you've got a situation where you've got a married couple and one spouse works for a company and makes a lot of money through their salary, then a great, great planning idea, and this is probably one of the best planning opportunities available if you are a W-2, is to have your spouse who is not a high earner to qualify as an active real estate professional. So there's a number of rules that apply before you can be a real estate professional. The most basic one is that you have to spend 750 hours a year managing your properties. It will also require you, you know, to own a, multiple properties to somehow manage these. You don't necessarily have to be the one out, you know, making repairs yourself. You can oversee a team that does that, but you will be required to build up a portfolio of, of properties and you will have to be involved in, and your spouse will have to spend that 750 hours a year. So this is a great way to get 
deductions from real estate investing in a real estate business by one spouse that can create positive income. So you, you're making cash flow, but it's tax preferred because you're usually showing losses on your tax return. And then if they qualify as a real estate professional, then their losses from their real estate business can offset the other spouse's business income from their salary. So they have to qualify as a real estate professional and be active in order to have that offset happen. But this is just a great tool as far as di completely different ways of making money, but doing it in a way that one can create really tax preferred income and in, in addition to that losses that can offset tax inefficient income like a salary. So that's, I think, the best opportunity if you can set that up. If your spouse does not want to spend 750 hours a year managing properties, or for some reason just doesn't want to do that type of work, then number four is called the short-term real estate loophole. So this is a great kind of, it's, it's gotten a lot of um, attention the last few years with Airbnb and VRBO and those types of businesses where you can just list properties pretty easily and manage them pretty passively. But the short-term real estate loophole is a way that you can get some of the benefits of investing in real estate without having to spend that 750 hours or from managing different types of property. So you're dealing with, and number four, we're dealing with short-term rental property. So think about things listed on Airbnb where you've got people coming in and just renting it for a couple nights or maybe a week, as opposed to being a real estate professional in number three, where you're managing properties that have tenants come in and sign year long leases and that type of thing. So they're very different in the type of rental properties we're talking about. But number four is a way that you can get most of the benefits that you can get as a real estate professional without having to spend as much time and dealing with kind of the, the more um, complicated type of real estate investing. So if you are interested in learning more about the short-term real estate loophole, I have a, a separate video, I'll link to it below, where I, I cover all the rules and what that involves. And you can understand that in a little bit more detail, what that involves. Number five is passive real estate investing. So maybe you don't wanna go out and own properties yourself. You don't really have the time because you're you know working for your company full-time. And maybe you aren't married or your spouse just isn't interested in managing properties on the side and doing that as their business. So you can also invest in real estate passively. You can do this through investing in funds or syndications, things where you pull your money as a limited partner investor into a fund or a group where they're going to go out and there's, there's a fund manager or sponsor that will go out and buy properties, manage the investments themselves. So you don't really have to do anything other than your due diligence on the deal and the sponsor that you're going to invest with. I really like this idea a lot because I know a lot of people don't want, we're kind of in a trend where we wanna spend less time working and more time having fun and traveling and, the, and with our family and that type of thing. So three and four add a little bit more work for either, you know, three would be for your spouse, and four would be potentially for yourself if you're going to be the one managing the short-term rentals. But five allows you to get most of the benefits from real estate investing that you can get from you know owning properties directly, but you're very passive. You know, Think of mailbox money where you send your money off to a, a sponsor and you just get distributions from the investments themselves and then big distributions on the back end when they go and sell the properties. So it's not, it's not completely passive because you do have to do your due diligence on sponsors. There's a lot of kind of sleaziness out there in that industry. And a lot of people just quite frankly don't have a good track record and that you have to watch out for. But once you find good quality sponsors to invest with, this can be a great tool. And you don't get to, so you still, with real estate investing, you're gonna show a lot of losses on those K-1s from those investments. But because it's passive, you don't get to take that and offset that against your active business W-2 income but it is a good way to start investing and building wealth in a tax efficient way. So the last thing you wanna do as a W-2 employee is to get your money through a salary, which is already the least efficient way you can earn money, and then invest that money in a way that's not efficient. You want to make sure you're at least investing that money in the most efficient way possible from a tax standpoint. And one way to do that is this number five with passive real estate investing. So the last one I'm gonna to talk to you about is conservation easements. 
So you've either probably never heard of this before or you've heard of it and it scares the crap out of you because you know these always get audited. So what are conservation easements? They are situations where you basically own, you know, certain types of land or ownership rights with respect to land or it can work for a building and you give up that ownership right to that land or that building to some sort of, you know, charitable, um, it can be like a charity, it can be like a governmental unit, but you're basically giving up your ownership of that land for future use. So for, for conservation of that property. So think about if you owned, you know, a bunch of wetlands or something, you might give that up to the government to preserve for various reasons why, you know, you can think about various reasons why we would want to preserve that type of land. And you don't, you give up your ownership to that land. So what you get for that is a tax deduction. And, and what it is, is basically a non-cash charitable contribution. So you do get a charitable deduction on your tax return. And this can be quite large because it's the value of the ownership right in those, the land that you're giving up. So I think this is a great tax planning tool if this is a fact pattern that makes sense for you. So if for some reason you own a lot of property and you can do a conservation easement by giving up, you know, some of your ownership to that property to a charity that specializes in this or to some sort of governmental unit that's interested in that, then it's a great way to create a tax deduction. But where it goes wrong is that there have been a lot of people abusing this. So Whenever there's a tax planning opportunity, there's always going to be promoters who are out there trying to, you know, manufacture these big tax deductions that don't necessarily make sense or fit a good fact pattern and abuse them by creating crazy valuations. So what happened is that there's all these promoters who were basically saying, you know, invest in this. We're going to create a conservation easement. They'd go out there and get these ridiculous appraisals that were like, you know, way in excess of what the value should have really been for the land or whatever they were giving up. And then the people were taking, you know, deductions on their tax return for that. So if w w before you ever do this, you should keep in mind that this likelihood of audit for these types of things is very, very high. The IRS hates conservation easements because of the abuse that's happened in the past. And it's quite likely there will be a law change on this in the future, if very soon, I think, that will will no longer allow you to do this or we're severely limit it to where it might not be that beneficial. So I would never do this with a promoter, honestly. I, you know, I just, I think the chances of you getting audited are almost 100% in that case. They're going to attack the valuation. They always come after the appraisals and it's appraisals can be very subjective so it's very easy for the irs to kind of get in there and argue that that's wrong and even if your conservation easement that you did with a promoter does withstand the attack all the money and time and stress that you're going to endure from that audit is just not worth it so i would not do this if you are doing it through a promoter and someone who just you know is selling this as some sort of tax planning strategy where i would do this is if you are someone who lives in a more rural area and you own land and you do think there's an opportunity to to do a conservation easement and it just is bona fide i mean think about like a situation like i've got this land or maybe i'll go buy some land and then do the conservation easement with it and get a tax benefit for that because sometimes you can buy it at a, at a you know a reduced price for some reason and somehow get a you know an appraisal that is, is a bona fide appraisal but for more than you paid for it that can be a benefit but just be careful if if you're abusing this you're going to get audited and you're not going to withstand audit and even if for some reason you do it's not going to be pretty the process and it's not going to be worth it so i like conservation easements i don't shy away from them because i do think if if this is provided for in the tax code which it is it's sanctioned it's allowed if you follow the law and you do it and you know, you're know you doing it in a respectable way and getting a respectable appraisal, then it's fine and perfectly, you should have no issues doing this. You may have an audit, but it shouldn't be a big deal. But where I wouldn't do this is through some sort of promoter who's marking this as some sort of tax plan strategy because that's not what it was intended for. The IRS doesn't like it and they will come after you for this. So those are a few of the tax plan opportunities that I think are really good if you are a W-2 full-time employee. I do want to talk to you a bit about some of the tax planning options out there that I hear marketed as good planning ideas for W-2 earners that I would not do or ever recommend. So the first is oil and gas. A lot of people used to do, and I know a lot of promoters would go out there and try to target this as being a great investment for anyone who's a full-time employee because you get deductions and sometimes you can deduct the full amount in the first year 
from oil and gas investments. I don't recommend this because I think oil and gas is generally a bad investment. I never invested in it. I've never seen it go well for anybody I know that has. I think it's very risky and speculative. So if you don't know what you're doing, and I'm not a specialist in investing in oil and gas, so I would never recommend it. So basically, bottom line, do not invest in something just to get the tax benefit. So I think most of the people I know who ever did invest in oil and gas type investments were doing it for the tax benefits and it didn't turn out well for them. So you should never just make an investment purely for the tax benefits. So that's why I don't recommend that because one, I think it's just a risky investment. I don't know it very well and I don't think it's usually done in a way that, you know, is, is a good idea from a tax and or investment standpoint. Also, what I, I see a lot of people do is invest in things like muni bonds that give off tax-free interest and where, you know, your returns aren't subject to tax, at least, you know, on the federal side and or on the state side in some cases. So again, don't make an investment just for the tax benefits in a lot of cases because muni bonds pay, the returns on those are so low that you're not going to build wealth, you know, in a big way over time. You need to be earning a higher rate of return in order to, you know, start to, to compound your earnings and your investment growth over time. So I never invest in things like that that are purely just because I don't have to pay tax on the income if the returns just don't justify that. Also, I don't like 401ks and IRAs. Those aren't tax savings. Those just kick the, the tax bill down the line to when you retire. And I know a lot of the talk is that, well, I make a lot of money in my W-2 job now and I'm gonna make a lot less when I retire. Well, that might be true, at least for the first few years, but if you build up a bunch of money inside a 401k or IRA, when you're start required, you know, to take required mandatory distributions, you can often find yourself in the highest tax bracket just when you add your social security that you get every year, any kind of investment income, which hopefully you are getting investment income. If not, you didn't set things up right when you retire. And when you add your RMDs that you're required to take from your 401k or IRA, I see very frequently people find themselves in the highest tax bracket pretty quickly. Also, no clue what tax rates will be. We do know they're going up. They go up in a few years when the ta Trump tax cuts um, do expire. And I think it's unlikely, I, I personally think it's highly unlikely we'll see that those tax reductions extended in the current political environment. But I don't, you know, I would never bank on tax rates being lower in the future than they are today. So these are a number of the, the tax plan opportunities that I think are available to you as a W-2 employee, but also some things I wouldn't do if I was a, you know, a full-time employee. But again, you know, think about the fact that are there ways to shift the type of money you're making as employee if there is an ability to work with your employer or maybe become an independent contractor and shift the money from being W-2 to 1099? That's always great. It's always preferred from a tax standpoint. And you always want to think about investments and making money in an after-tax lens because when you factor in the tax that you're paying, that can have a huge impact on the money that you put in your pocket every year. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe to our channel.